Good day, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Ian Binney. I'm the Education Coordinator of the Gallipoli Association. The Gallipoli Association is a study group which aims to promote knowledge and understanding of the Gallipoli campaign, part of the First World War, uh, which took place uh, between 1915 and 1916 in present day Turkey. This lesson is going to last about 15 minutes and by the end of it I hope you'll know quite a lot about the campaign. Uh, you may uh, know something at the end of it about this group of British soldiers, the Lancashire Fusiliers, which landed on uh, the Turkish beaches in Gallipoli uh, on April the 25th 1915. Um, the Gallipoli Peninsula, part of the present day Turkey. In 1915, uh, Turkey had a large empire um, which included quite a lot of the Middle East and was called the Ottoman Empire. And we use those terms inter interchangeably, um, Turkey and the Ottoman Empire. You notice there's a long thin strip of water there um, beginning at the Dardanelles going through the Sea of Mamara, then in past the then Turkish capital, Constantinople, uh, nowadays called Istanbul, into the Black Sea. You probably know that Britain and France were fighting Germany, uh, that Turkey was a, uh, an ally of Germany, and Russia was an ally of uh, Britain and France which made up what was called the Third Entente, getting supplies through um, from uh, Britain and France to the Russian Empire. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, was important and to do so um, it would have been a lot easier had the Allies been able to uh, send supplies through the Dardanelles into the Black Sea. So the aims of this lesson. By the end of it, I hope you'll be able to answer these questions. Uh, why was an invasion of Gallipoli launched? Uh, what were the key events of the campaign? How did it become a crisis, because it certainly did, for the British? Why did the Gallipoli campaign fail? How was the fighting different to that on the Western Front? Because you almost certainly know uh, that Britain and France were fighting Germany. Uh, the main effort uh, was on the Western Front, a line of trenches uh, in Belgium and France. And it's important to remember uh, that Britain, and by that of course we mean the British Empire, uh, Britain lost and the Turks won. And there's a photograph of some rather cheerful looking uh, Turkish soldiers. Uh, so the Gallipoli Association actually studies a major British defeat. That doesn't take away um, from the courage of the soldiers that took part and of course the courage of the Turks uh, who eventually won. So um, the first part and that picture shows some troops coming across, um, ashore uh, on the beaches at Gallipoli. Uh, first part, why was the invasion of Gallipoli launched? Well, the first reason uh, was to knock away the props to Germany. Um, the First World War, as you probably know, began in August 1914. Germany had invaded France and Belgium, but her army had been stopped at a battle called the Battle of the Marne, just short of Paris. After that, there was deadlock on the Western Front. Uh, the British and French armies faced the prospect of trying to drive the Germans from a line of 45 trenches. Some politicians believed it was easier to concentrate on Germany's allies, such as Turkey, they made up what we call the central powers. Defeating these countries and knocking them out of the war would weaken the Germans, they believed. In Britain, these politicians were known as Easterners, as they felt it was much better to make the main effort in Eastern Europe rather than the Western Front. Uh, the most famous British Easterner was Winston Churchill. And uh, there's a picture of German soldiers in the trenches, the deadlock. Uh, uh, had occurred, uh, German trenches uh, facing British or French trenches across uh, no man's land. There is um, a young Winston Churchill, who was then the first Lord of the Admiralty, who was really promoting taking the war into the East and promoted the Gallipoli campaign. When it failed, he was one of the people who were blamed for that failure. 
Another very important reason, of course, was to knock Turkey out of the war themselves, uh, not just uh, weaken their support uh, for Germany. Um, so uh, Britain and France wanted to defeat Turkey anyway. Uh, they hoped to carve up the remains of the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East between themselves. Parts of that empire were very rich in oil and other resources. The Ot Ottoman Empire was very weak. It was described as the sick man of Europe. Uh, the Turks had lost a series of wars just before the outbreak of the World War I called the Balkan Wars against small countries like Greece. So the Allies leaders thought it'd be easy to defeat the Turks. Some felt all they had to do was to send ships to bombard the capital Constantinople and uh, they would surrender. And as I've mentioned before, a third reason to open an easier supply rate, uh, route rather to Russia. Um, uh, Russia hadn't started the First World War well, was short of a lot of uh, the things needed to fight a modern war. Um, so Britain and France wanted to send supplies to Russia, but it was rather difficult to do so. Um, and it was much easier if they could control uh, the Dardanelles. So I've divided the phases of the Gallipoli campaign into three. The first phase we'll talk about in a moment is a naval attack and the landings, March to April 1915. Phase two, stalemate and more landings. Fail phase three, more stalemate and then a final evacuation of British and French troops. And again, I stress when we talk about British, we mean the British Empire. And there's a picture of one of the many cemeteries that there are on the Gallipoli Peninsula today. Who was involved? Uh, Gallipoli is often associated with troops from Australia and New Zealand, call it the Anzacs. Their contribution was very important. They provided about 65,000 soldiers. And there's a clip from a very famous Australian film, Gallipoli, uh, same title, uh, starring a very young Mel Gibson. But the majority of the 345,000 Allied troops were British and Irish, with a strong contingent from the Empire, including Newfoundland and India. And there was a large French contingent as well. So, phase one. Uh, the Allied leaders decided um, to launch a naval attack on the Dardanelles. They believed that would be enough. That would be enough to defeat the Turks. They could sail through the Dardanelles, bombard Constantinople, and they would surrender. But the Turks, who turned out to be very determined, a very determined enemy, had laid mines in the water, underwater mines, and a number of ships were sunk. There were two attacks, one in February and then another on the 18th of March. Uh, but uh, they, a number of ships, HMS Irresistible, HMS Ocean, and the French battlefield battleship Bouvet were sunk, and HMS Infatigable was damaged, uh, and the Allied fleet had to withdraw. And there's a map which shows it um, the, uh, in graphic detail, uh, the um, uh, Allied ships, British and French ships hitting mines, all being hit by gunfire from uh, the uh, batteries on the shore. And uh, the 18th of March 1915, quite rightly remembered as a very important day in Turkish history, and there's one of the heroes of the uh, Turkish army, at Le a statue rather, uh, loading um, a shell into a gun. There's many memorials to the defeat of the Allied fleet as well as the defeat of the Allied army on the peninsula itself. So um, the naval attack failed, um, so it was decided to land a uh, collection of troops onto the peninsula, an amphibious assault onto the peninsula. And the aim was to push the Turkish army away from the Dardanelles, capture the shore guns, so the fleet could remove the mines and sail on to Constantinople. So the first landings took place at, a, um, uh, at two beaches, two sets of beaches rather, um, the uh, British beaches um, in the south at a place called Hellas, and um, it was then that the Lancashire Fusiliers uh, were amongst a group who landed at W Beach, winning six VCs before breakfast. Uh, on W Beach and another beach, V Beach, casualties were very heavy. On the others, casualties were light. Um, but due to poor leadership, Allied troops failed to press on land and a real opportunity was lost. 
and uh, there's a picture showing uh, the two sets of landings. I'll talk about the, uh, the ones at Anzac in a moment. Uh, uh, Hellas down at the southern tip of uh, the uh, Gallipoli Peninsula and um, V-Beach troops um, uh, arrived. Some troops were landed uh, in an old converted transport ship called the River Clyde, but very, very heavy casualties, a very famous scene uh, from the campaign. And one of the most dramatic photos of World War I, um, uh, landing at the V Beach on the 25th of April uh, 1915, not a stage photo at all. You can see it's taken from the River Clyde. You can see Allied dead and uh, British uh, dead and uh, wounded lying on those smaller boats called lighters. And you see a dark patch of uh, British and uh, British troops sheltering from the very, very heavy Turkish gunfire. And uh, the Australians, the Anzac troops, as we call them, Australian New Zealanders, uh, landed uh, further north in a separate place. Uh, a number of mistakes were made. They landed too far north in very difficult terrain. I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Uh, the troops became mixed up and it took quite a long time uh, before uh, they could reach their objectives. A Turkish general, we'll mention in a moment, called Mustafa Kemal, organised fierce resistance and counterattacks. And at one point, the Australian commander, Birdwood, uh, considered evacuation, but they hung on there. And the second phase, stalemate and further landings. And Hellas, the Turks quickly reinforced the southern front and a stalemate developed in front of a village called Krithia. And there are at least four battles of Krithia in May 1915. Uh, costly Allied assaults with inadequate artillery preparation achieved little and brought the Allies no closer uh, to the objectives of the hills of Achi Baba, uh, which always were in the distance. The Turks themselves suffered heavily in repeated counterattacks. And there's a, a picture all too often uh, that happened. Allied assaults, British assaults, resulting in very heavy casualties and very little gain. There was stalemate also on the Anzac front uh, with the Australians and New Zealanders. Um, they were penned in and a very small uh, beachhead dominated by the high ground. Uh, the Turks launched a very large offensive in May themselves, but suffered heavy casualties. But Anzac attacks were just as unsuccessful. Uh, eventually, Hamilton took some troops from Anzac to reinforce the attacks at Krithia, but these were equally unsuccessful. He, uh, Hamilton then tried a new tactic or new strategy, which was to land further north behind the Turks at a place called Suvla Bay. And that they took place on the 6th of August. Surprised the Turks, um, virtually unopposed, but once again, very poor leadership amongst the British uh, meant opportunities were lost. They failed to press on to the hills beyond and eventually, uh, like the Anzacs, hemmed into small beachhead. And again, there was trench deadlock. And there's another in very interesting picture or significant picture, British troops landing on Suvla Bay. You see, they're not pressing inland, they're stopping. They're stopping, they should have been pressing inland to capture the hills. And another picture there of the scene on the beach, not a sign, not a scene of uh, British soldiers uh, rushing inwards to capture these hills. Um, August offensive, um, Hamilton, uh, I'll come back to Hamilton in a moment, um, launched a large scale offensive from Anzac um, to coincide with these Suvla landings to try and uh, uh, secure the Sari Bear range. Uh, Allied troops briefly seized a mountain called Chunuk Bear and they thought uh, they were going to be victorious because they could look down onto the other side of the Dardanelles, but they eventually driven off. And it was during this offensive the attack of the neck on the neck took place, featured in the film Gallipoli. Another offensive was launched at the end of August. It was badly planned and coordinated and resulted in heavy casualties. Similar to had it become a crisis for the British? Well, it's something called mission creep. The Allied leaders had hoped for a quick victory on the peninsula and a relatively easy defeat of Turkey. But they quickly became bogged down in what we call a war of attrition. And the Allies were forced to send more and more troops or withdraw. 
and to start with they sent more and more divisions more divisions of troops were taken that could have gone to the western front and so those generals were particularly annoyed and it's a photograph there of uh, British troops arriving so phase three more stalemate in evacuation um, they, um, the politicians uh, as there was stalemate in all three fronts Helles, Anzac and Suvla the politicians had tired of the campaign and by the end of September three divisions were removed casualties very high uh, from sniping trench raids and the limited offensives which both the British and French carried out disease very very significant particularly one called dysentery swept through both armies and the weather became terrible as winter approached so in the end um, Hamilton was replaced as so I'll come back to him in a moment um, and uh, evacuation had been discussed early in mid-October um, but um, Hamilton had resisted um, and uh, Lieutenant James Munro replaced him and they decided to evacuate the French were equally tired of the campaign and the evacuation ironically the best managed aspect of the campaign and um, uh, the Suva and Anzac were evacuated in December 1915, Helles in January 1916. A lot of equipment was left behind which had to be set fire to, destroyed, hundreds of horses and mules were, dis were slaughtered. Um, but the Turks were delighted, they defeated a major invasion of their homeland. So why did the Gallipoli campaign fail? Three key reasons, the Turks themselves, poor Allied leadership and terrain. The Turks, they had plenty of time to prepare. They rushed troops into the area, 62,000. The Turkish army had been reformed and improved after their defeats in the Balkan Wars um, by, with German help. And it was a German officer who commanded the main Turkish force in the area, a man called Limon von Sanders. Many of the officers, Turkish officers were both capable and experienced. Mustafa Kemal, divisional commander, was an outstanding leader. The NCOs and other ranks were generally very tough fight as well. Intelligence, control and coordination of troops was often better than that of the Allies. Of course it was easier to get supplies, particularly water which was always scarce on the peninsula from Constantinople. Medical facilities for the Turks themselves were actually quite a lot better than is often thought and the Turks were fighting to defend their homeland, not part of an empire, their homeland, Turkey itself. Um, but they often suffered very heavy casualties and attacks on Allied trenches. Sir Ian Hamilton, General Sir Ian Hamilton was Commander-in-Chief um, and there were other generals uh, like General Stopford um, who uh, weren't that capable, they weren't that good at what they were supposed to do. Um, so, um, um, senior British leaders have argued about the campaign, they never sent enough troops and equipment to have any chance of winning, uh, there was never enough artillery. Uh, the infantry were often inexperienced and lacked training and uh, some divisions were sent without their artillery. Um, history has not been kind to Sir Ian Hamilton, I've mentioned him a number of times uh, and some, of the his some other historians think that many of the uh, British senior officers like Stopford uh, was were poor quality. Anzac senior officers were generally good quality but Allied intelligence were often poor, there was never enough detailed maps, attacking troops often got lost, Allied attacks were often badly planned and coordinated um, and there was rarely an e effective artillery bombardment. Allied officers, although usually very brave, often lost control of their troops once the fighting had begun. The Allies completely underestimated the fighting ability of the Turks. The terrain, reason three, the terrain, terrain in Gallipoli, the land in Gallipoli Peninsula favoured the Turkish defenders, very mountainous area, even the lowland areas are hilly and covered with thick bushes, it's not surprising that the Allied attackers often got lost. Um, the Turks always seem to be in control of the high ground, uh, leaving the Allies to attack uphill. Little natural water on the peninsula, when the Allies had a numerical advantage over the Turks, it was difficult for them to exploit it because of the hills and the mountains. It was impossible to use cavalry. Um, many cavalry troops were there, but fought dismounted. The Allies were often hemmed into cramped beaches under Turkish observation. There's a picture of uh, 
an attack. There's some uh, terrain that the British, in this case Gurkhas, had to attack out. Uh, that shows how uh, they were cramped in, the British on the hills. And there's a picture of some of the terrain at a famous battlefield, part of the battlefield called uh, Scimitar Hill. Uh, some of it's been destroyed in the modern day bushfire, real problem in Gallipoli. So did it achieve anything? <sighs> the, the campaign, uh, the Turks held the Allies back with relative ease. They went on and fought until 1918 and their victory stiffened their resolve uh, to carry on fighting. Germany only had to divert very limited resources. Um, the Turks had to divert resources from other campaigns. And one interesting thing is the planners of D-Day studied the campaign, studied what not to do in an amphibious landing. So could it ever succeeded? Generally, the view is no. Uh, some most historians would say that even if Turkey had been knocked out of the war, Germany would continue to fight on. Uh, some contend that even if they'd opened the supply route to Russia, um, it wouldn't have stiffened that country's resolve, just led to even more scarce resources being wasted on a wavering ally. Some historians say that Turkey, if not having to defend the peninsula, may have been more able to pose uh, a threat to Egypt and other British interests, but even that is debatable. So, how was the fighting different to the Western Front? There are many similarities. Um, the scenes, if you know something about the Western Front, will seem uh, very familiar. Uh, troops spent much of the time in trenches facing the enemy across no man's land. Attacks, usually preceded by an artillery bombardment, meant going over the top and hopefully capturing the enemy trenches. When there wasn't an attack, life was often boring, unpleasant and dangerous. And there's a photograph of casualties uh, in one of the many British attacks on the, the Turkish trenches. The weather, uh, the Western Front's famous for, uh, this is one of the differences, rain and mud. The weather during Gallipoli varied from extremely hot, um, which made the shortage of water even more acute and caused uh, disease. Uh, but also then in the winter, there was torrential rain, which washed away the trenches on both sides. In December, there was heavy snow and blizzards. Soldiers on both sides suffered frostbite. Uh, some even died from exposure. And there's a picture of some of the trenches that they had to spend that winter in. Lack of resources. Uh, due to arguments among the Allied leaders, not enough soldiers and resources were sent to the peninsula. There was never enough artillery to effectively bombard the Turkish trenches. Allied attacks often launched with the enemy barbed wire and defences intact, which is very different to what the British were doing later in uh, on the Western Front in the First World War. There just weren't enough of those big guns in that picture. And uh, um, looks like plentiful resources there, but not enough were given to the army um, to actually win in Gallipoli. And a, a third difference to the Western Front, lack of escape for the soldiers. Uh, most of the Allied positions were overlooked by the Turks. The soldiers, there's no break from Turkish shelling or sniper fire. Uh, this was even the case uh, when soldiers were in reserve trenches. Leave, which is very important to the soldiers in the Western Front, difficult as soldiers had to travel to one of the islands um, nearby islands and even if this was allowed they had to cross beaches under fire and uh, there gets a first aid post there which would almost certainly be under Turkish observation and regularly shelled and uh, uh, snipers firing. Um, some sources here which I won't say very much about because I've gone over uh, much longer than I said originally um, but there's some sources uh, if your teacher wishes to use them uh, of course they can do um, but these are primary sources uh, from diaries of people or letters from soldiers involved in the campaign. Uh, there's two sources I'm going over the top and uh, sources on trench life. The cost, Allied casualties approximately 302,000. It was meant to be a quick victory, an easy defeat of the Turks. Approximately 57,000 being French. Of those casualties, well over a third were due to sickness, as I said, mainly dysentery. The Turks lost approximately 250,000. 
and the legacy Mustafa Kemal became the first pres president of Turkey uh, Kemal Ataturk uh, and he wished as well as commemorating his countrymen's sacrifice during the campaign in the sort of statue uh, we've seen uh, but also right from the start allowed foreign visitors to the peninsula including relatives of the allied dead and he famously said uh, about the allied dead therefore rest in peace there is no difference between the Johnnies and the Mehmets to us where they lie side by side here in this country of ours. You, the mothers who send their sons, sent their sons from faraway countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosom and are in peace. After having lost their lives on this land, they have become our sons. Very moving words from a great general and the founder and first president of Monday Turkey. Lots of memorials there. Um, there's 22,000 uh, British soldiers or um, uh, British and Empire soldiers buried in 31 cemeteries. There are five memorials to 14,000 missing uh, who uh, didn't have uh, their own grave. There's also cemeteries on the island of Lemnos, which is a hospital base. There's two French cemeteries nearby, as, uh, on the peninsula rather, uh, with 12,000 bodies. Many Turkish memorials and cemeteries as well, uh, mainly on the Asian shore, uh, which um, reflects uh, the importance of the naval campaign. And finally, a German officer, because there were some Germans fighting there, uh, served at Gallipoli, uh, said never in history of so many countries sent so many of their young men to such a small place to die. And that's it. Almost uh, we're at the end.